Clojure Script is a high-level scripting language built on top of Clojure, which is top built on top of Lisp, which is built on top of Java, and I already don't know what I'm talking about here, and I didn't from the beginning either. Basically, it's a scripting language that allows uh, for pretty easy software implementations of these very broad topics uh, to make it a, a very way, easy way to interact with servers and, and, and things like that. Uh, our guest today, Mike Fikes, is taking ClojureScript and he wants to bring it into the real world using hardware that he's designed. So he's been designing an ESP32 based device that he is manufacturing himself, he's selling them, he's putting these things out into the world so that he can bring ClojureScript to the masses and actually do some real world modifications of his environment, lighting up LEDs, driving motors, all of the usual things you might want to do with low level hardware, but he's doing with a very, very, very high level language. And Mike is a great example of someone who's taking electronics and the knowledge that he's gained within the electronics field and applying it to his normal field of software. And he's doing, he's doing this for his, his, uh, his company, but also for his personal enrichment. That's another thing that comes through in this episode. I really enjoyed learning about how Mike is learning and teaching himself. He does two things that are, I think, great examples. One is he takes Ben Eater's class, which is basically Ben, ben has a uh, set of videos on YouTube where he shows you how to build a computer from the ground up. It's a wonderful resource, if, especially if you want to get into like vintage electronics, but even just understanding how a CPU works, building a custom CPU. Boy, there's not many better ways to do that and building it on a breadboard. So he'll show some of that. Uh, and then the second one is he got a mentor who's Bill Hurd. Bill Hurd helped build the Commodore C128. And uh, both Ben and Bill have been guests on my past, my other podcast, The Amp Hour. And so we will link that in as well. Uh, both are really great uh, uh, teachers and uh, electronics designers, as is Mike. Mike has really been showing that he has dug into this field and, uh, and he is a software person, natively software, building on, on this hardware stuff. So I'm excited to show you and uh, talk to Mike Fikes here. And I uh, hope you enjoy episode five of the Contextual Electronics Podcast. Welcome back to the Contextual Electronics Podcast. Today we're talking to Mike Fikes, who is involved with ClojureScript and has built some of his own hardware. And I'm going to bring Mike on screen here. Mike, thank you for coming on the Contextual Electronics Podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Hi, Chris. Yeah, I'm excited to be here as well. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yourself. I mean, so you are coming from a software background. That's and on the true. Contextual, on yeah. the electronics, Contextual Electronics Podcast, we were kind of interested in people coming from lots of different realms into the electronics space. So I'm, I'm very curious about what that looks like you coming into the electronic space from the software side. Yeah, yeah. So I've been like a software engineer, engineer my whole life, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And it's only been over the past three years or so that I've been getting into electronics. Um, and uh, I was thinking about this and I'm like, what, what got me into it? What kind of sucked me into this whole thing? And it was honestly, uh, there were a set of videos that uh, Ben Eater had put together where he was building um, a, a computer based on TTL chips, a, a breadboard computer. And that was great for me, you know, from coming from a software background, because I never, to be honest, I never really understood how computers worked at the bottom, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think the, yeah, the Ben Eater videos are amazing. If people haven't checked those out, his YouTube channel, he just, I mean, he built it all up from the, from like, from the ALU up through the processing, yeah. kind of pushing code through it. So like, what, what, what are those I videos? I actually are? got the book. Um, so I'm a book. Up, there's a oh, book okay. that he based his stuff on. So if you, you, you know, of course, I think I, I learned best by just watching his videos, but if you want to dig deeper, the book has like all the, you know, the same stuff roughly. And what he ends up building is one of the computers. It's called the SAP in this book, the simple as possible computer. <laughs> uh, and I actually yeah. have one here uh, that I can show real quick. It's basically a partially completed one, <laughs> but it's yeah. like, you know, that for me, it was like, uh, you know, coming from a software background, of course you can understand like logic you're in software, you're dealing with Boolean values and whatnot. And that's what a lot of this stuff is, is gates and whatnot. And, um, so it's like, it's a pretty, uh, easy introduction to electronics. Cause you're not dealing with a bunch of analog stuff. Maybe is that a better way to put it. Well, everything's yeah. analog. Let's yes, be honest. exactly. Yeah, yeah. At the bottom but, it uh, is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And if you were going to have problems, you might see the signals, you know, not rising fast enough or definitely but that's really the, the fun thing about that kind of, so just to describe it for people that are just yeah, listening, sorry, yeah. it's a, uh, it's a breadboard. It's a very big breadboard. <laughs> it's, it's probably what, like 18 inches by 12 yeah, it's, inches. It's a total of like maybe like seven breadboards. <laughs> yeah, it's, also like, yeah. it's like the size of a large pizza, a large square pizza, a uh, rectangle pizza with lots uh, of chips on it and wires yeah. sticking out everywhere. <laughs> Jump yeah. And so what, I mean, how many chips are on there? Do you, do you have like a kind of oh. a statistical? Oh, it looks like maybe like 20 to 40, but I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then the wiring, yeah. So it is point to point wiring. Oh yeah, then... yeah. So it, like you said, um, I do remember um, that like the um, the analog stuff comes into play, especially like with the um, the power supply, the power lines going everywhere. It gets mm-hmm. kind of like hokey, or even some of the like the clock. There's a clock down in the lower corner, and the clock lines. You know, they by the time they make it to the other side of the board, yeah. Even yeah. at this, you know, you're running these things at really slow rates, so you know. It doesn't matter that much, but you get to see it, you know, if you if you hook up an oscilloscope to it. And I didn't even yeah. have an oscilloscope when I was building this, so it's kind of right, like, right. you know, I was just getting into it. And, and the well, main... I mean, that's that's perfect though, because that shows the you know the the true effects of inductance and capacitance and like and resistance of the lines and just like how it's going to end up impacting your signals as it traverses a much larger area than in a you know you basically you're building up a, a CPU and much much larger than. What a traditional C- what a CPU is these days, you know, you get an eighty fifty one these days, it's going to be a yeah. tiny little speck of sand, basically. So yeah, and, a... and just to put things in perspective, at that point in time, I didn't even know that you needed to add a resistor to an LED, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, you know, you you could probably think back how long ago it was that you learned that, but for me, it was just a few years ago. <laughs> you know, some days I wonder if I yeah. even ever learned that. You know, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> repeatedly yeah. forget and do it again yeah yeah that, that's great though and and that kind of hands-on i mean we obviously love hands-on around here um you know what what were some of the things that you were able to draw out of uh, a project like that i mean project-based so, education another so favorite of me, ours for me it was like this um like like the light went on in my head of how computers actually work and you know even like the simple idea of what a clock is uh, you know I'd never really thought about it. I thought a clock was just like an actual clock, like a wall, you know, something that told time. I didn't know that all it was was a square wave driving things, you know. And and also another part that I found really interesting was uh, down the middle of this thing is a bus. Um, mm. And and just the, the the notion that you had like the, the tri-state stuff, you know, like high Z, and, and you would have like different parts of the computer. Um, you know, most of the chips are turned off. They're all in high Z mode, just not doing anything, but only one person writes to the bus and, that that I found extremely intriguing, just understanding like how a bus works, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And I think that yeah, these are terms that you might have heard, but again, you don't have the physical implementation because, especially maybe yes. coming from the software world, like a lot of stuff just gets abstracted. It's like, oh yeah, bus, whatever, you know, like, uh, um, you know, throw the sig- signal onto the bus, right? If you're using like a I squared C line or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And and yet it is. It's shared lines. It's shared power. It's uh, you know, it's it's these things that that make the terminology very, very real, it seems like. Yeah, another and, one of those is uh, microcode. Um, I had, you know, I had heard of the term microcode, never thought about what, what it really meant. And Ben Eater goes all the way down to the bottom and explains to you, you know, like if you're going to implement a move instruction in your language, uh, you know, below, you know, there's the clock rate. And then <laughs> the way Ben Eater explains it really well, it's like below that's like um, another clock that's going even faster, maybe six cycles for every real clock cycle. And the microcode is just basically, I, I like to think of it as like the way like a four stroke lawnmower engine works. You know, it's just oh, like yeah. at the bottom, like it's the gears underneath all of it. Like, and it's how you actually implement the instruction set. You know, if you mm-hmm. say, I want to move uh, some stuff from this register into RAM, you know, you have like this, the few, you know, the fetch cycle and all these little things below that. And that's, to me, it was like, man, this is awesome. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's like, now yeah. I understand there's no, it's like the magic goes away. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get to that, it's like, I've seen the magic now. And it's it's sad right. that you now know how it works, but it's like right. your mind gets blown. <laughs> so, I mean, well, then kind of moving back up the stack then. So, like, how how has this started to impact your everyday as someone who's still doing software? And, and like, yeah, does, it, does, yeah, it, so, does it change how you think about things? Or now is it like, you know, out of sight, out of mind, uh, whatever, resistors, I don't care. Yeah. So, so for me, it was just like this side hobby. And I'm like, and it, and it got me really interested in it. And then I started to want to learn like, you know, the analog parts of it that I wasn't getting, you know, and I, and I discovered, um, you know, this, this stuff, the art of electronic stuff, right? Oh, well, yeah. Um, and it, it surprisingly, it took me like a couple of years to discover that, that this thing existed. Well, that's, I yeah. think that's actually the right amount of time for art of electronics is a, a yeah, lot of people yeah. say to start with that. And I say, oh, do yeah. Not. So no, this yeah. is actually not the art of electronics itself. This that's is the, the workbook, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's like, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great one. And so you didn't actually, so did you get the art of electronics? Book I do have well? that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I yeah. agree. It's kind of like, man, you don't want to just sit down and read that thing. <laughs> it's yeah. Right. I mean, and, and, and like, that's a, you know, that's a common one I see in, you know, forum posts, what book should I get to get started? I'm like, ah, oh, that is not, yeah. it's just too much. It's too dense. And you know, it took me years and years to get through it. And 
and you keep going back to it of course it's like this great reference it's like an encyclopedia material. right i mean you just yeah exactly yeah you don't learn. you don't you don't go and start reading about aardvarks and you know and yeah exactly it's britannica you know, <laughs> yeah or wikipedia i suppose these days you know yeah. britannica kids are like what's britannica uh, <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean i, I think that 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 is kind of uh it can really hurt your motivation and your your uh, momentum right and momentum is always a big thing that i talk about is like okay, you yeah. have to get some small projects under your belt before you can start to build it up i mean so when yeah. you were doing the breadboard project was that was there small elements that build up to a big element or is it just kind of like dive in start hooking things up oh yeah so so this is also credit to ben eater the way he does things is each little each part of the breadboard is a separate piece and you just go through and learn, like, how, how do you make a 555 work to make a timer out of it, you know? Uh -huh. So you get, like, a lot of the immediate, uh, you know, feedback of what you're mm -hmm. doing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not like this fire hose that's too much to take in at once. You, you, you learn as you're going. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so definitely, yeah. It's it, this. It, I, I've thought about this. Like, the software field is pretty broad, and there's so much to know. And the same thing can be said about the hardware field. There's just, like so much stuff to know <laughs> oh, that, yeah. like you yeah. you could like drown in all of it right <laughs> i mean well to... it's gonna be the rest of my career mike so i mean i uh, yes i know <laughs> <laughs> but yeah about every two to three years i usually find a new field i'm like oh well here we go dive in ready to <laughs> ready yeah. to let's start doing rf let's start doing fpga let's start doing firmware you know yeah, like, and even yeah. even in art of electronics i'm just like learning how bjt transistors work to make you oh, know yeah. little emitter follower amplifiers stuff that you don't even probably even use that much today but it's like the basis for a lot of stuff i guess sure well and i think actually that's a great point though like so if you were say you're doing audio processing so one of the past courses of contextual electronics we did you know a class a amplifier which is just that it's a bjt amplifier or bjt transistor and a couple resistors and you got to bias the transistor properly and it's you know yeah. it's it's there's a lot of analog weirdness you got to deal with and learn about and it's it's tough but if you're a audio nut right you mm -hmm. might be like oh yeah i know all about like my favorite jfet or you know like how to bias properly and you know the efficiency curves of not the efficiency curve but just the efficiency of doing a class a amplifier which is very very low and i'm willing to do that for the sound and you know like and then you get into the audio file crowd uh, yeah, yeah so yeah there's and, and i think it is it's these it's these you know these uh silos of of different you know uh institutional knowledge that might be out there mm -hmm. but then if you zoom back out as a electronics level you can really um you can start to sample lots of different topics so are there other things in our electronics that you're you're interested in getting into uh so the next thing will be like the, the whole op amp thing right that's the okay. next yep, yep. and i so now at this point i can say that i know what they are but I have not, you know, <laughs> I haven't dealt with all the weird intricacies of how you can hook them up in various ways, you know? Oh yeah. So that's, well, that's, that's uh, yeah, that's a whole, that was, that was a job for me for about five years. And uh, yeah, it's that, that rabbit hole just keeps on going down and down and down, yeah. especially if you do precision measurement. It's, it's, it is limitless, but yeah, they're fun, fun things to learn about. And, and so what are you looking to build with that? Is that back to the uh, 8-bit computer or something else? Uh, so um so it's, for me, that that has been largely, I would say, the whole art of electronics and all that stuff has largely been, once Ben Eater got me sucked into this whole thing, <laughs> it's just been like this, you know, this desire to learn and, and kind of like, and the cool thing is, it's like, if it's a hobby, um, you can consume it at your own rate, right? You know, you, there's no one, there's no... Uh, job deadlines or whatever where you have to right. figure out this op amp you know no bosses and breathing down your neck or anything yeah yeah but it did start for me it did start to seep into work a bit um and that's uh that maybe maybe we could talk about that a little bit next is, sure. is where yeah. that led so you know I, i'm like you know when you're learning this stuff you're like oh that'd be cool to do this stuff at work right it's like this is so exciting uh i would like to actually like do this as my day job you know because mm -hmm. it's just so cool and and it turned out at work we we um we had like a um a software based product if you will it was an identity product and we were we started using that to unlock locks uh, specifically locks in cars what was what we were looking into and and I basically like uh, I had put together like stuff based on what I had learned out of you know from Ben Eater and whatnot I put together a demo on a breadboard that had an LED and it had a resistor. <laughs> And I was like demoing how to use our software to like pretend to unlock a lock and the LED would light up. Oh, you know? yeah. Um, and, and the feedback that I got was like, you need to actually, you know, this is not good enough. You, a breadboard with an LED lighting up is cool, but that's not going to fly. What you have to do is you actually have to unlock a real car. You know, to, to, oh, wow. it's, the, it's the mind trick where you're trying to convince someone that you have something that's real. You better unlock a real car if you do that, you know, if you want to really show it up. So right. I got into like all the, um, 
yeah, it turns out with um with cars, um, there's a thing called the CAN bus. Um, mm-hmm. And it's it's uh you know if you think about like when you go when your car is broken and they they plug in one of these kind of jacks to to get the diagnostic information and say oh the computer in your car is bad or whatnot you know um, it turns out that you know there's a network inside your car and you can jack into that same network and at least on older cars uh, you can actually send uh, the right the right commands to actually unlock your car. Um, mm. Through that, yeah, I think they've they've disabled that on some of the newer ones. Yeah, wanna, yeah, it's like a it's, it's kind of a bloops. security security yeah, thing. So right, that's right. but that's that's kind of where we were was uh, just trying to use that to demonstrate how to unlock cars using the CAN bus. And and where this led to was we were using um, I'm holding up now a Raspberry Pi, um, and on top of the Raspberry Pi is a is a CAN shield. Um, and essentially, you can imagine this is this is pretty easy to to program because it's effectively a computer, right? And um, I was at the time I was using um, Closure Script on it. Uh, you could use any language you want uh, to program these things, and and there's like a DB9 jack that can go out and just hook into your car. Uh, and this is basically what we were demoing with. And and um, these things are evidently uh, kind of fragile, right? You you don't want to just <laughs> unplug them while they're running. <laughs> I, I yes, suppose. that is true. Yeah. And, and I, I lost the SD card on it once, and I think that was because I didn't know better. <laughs> um, so we so we wanted to like. Um, kind of like up our game and learn how to like, well, we were worried. Like we started looking into like, how do you, like there's evidently like industrial strength enclosures that you can put these things inside of to keep mm-hmm. them powered up and try to protect, keep this thing alive. Right. <laughs> and yeah. we're like, maybe there's some way to do this. And I remember I was, I was, when I was digging into the can stuff, I remember seeing a lot of videos and I hit across Bill Hurd's videos where he's, he was messing with his car uh, with can. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, let's just see if we can get Bill to help us like make some real hardware that would actually survive and, and work. Yeah. Uh, and, and he fortunately said, yes, he, he was willing to work with yeah. us and try to figure That's out how great. to do this. And, and for me, that was, that was where it was almost like turning on the accelerator, right? Mm-hmm. Where now I had like this, this mentor effectively um, who could uh, teach me, you know, it, it made me actually quite kind of understand what a mentor actually is, you know, this oh, entire, really? my, my entire life I had so heard like, yeah. What about, I mean, so what about the relationship was, was specific? So, to so for me, like it's this? like, here you have someone who um, has experience, who knows the ins and outs of all the stuff you're dealing with. Right. And that person, you can have an actual dialogue with, and that person can see the one little thing that you're missing. Right. And, and Bill can say, Hey, Mike, how do you consider this little thing here? Um, mm. uh, and, and the light bulb would go off in my, so, so, so I had always thought earlier on in my career, like a mentor was someone who had to like, invest a lot of time to like teach you and ramp you up. And, and, and for me, it doesn't have to be that way. A mentor can just be the person who sees the one little thing that you're missing <laughs> and just points you in the right direction, you know, and, and is there to, you know, has that context and you don't get that out of a book, right? You, when you're learning stuff uh, mm-hmm. on your own or even watching Ben Eater, right? <laughs> sure. There's no, there's no human on the other end to see like, what's the part that you're missing, you know? Right. Right. I often talk about like uh, the the one thing that's one of the hardest things in any kind of like online uh, scenario like this is just like, what do I Google for? Right. How do I know where to even start? And then if you have but if you have a mentor, if you have someone that you're directly working with and mm-hmm. you're kind of like you're dancing around this idea, you're like, oh, I think I want to talk to cars and they'll be like can bus. You're like, what's can bus? And then you go down that rabbit hole and then they'll be like, well, sometimes it's also a Lin bus. What's Lin bus? Now you have this other thing to Google for. And it's it's just kind of this. Uh, it's like a, it's like a professional pointer outer, you know, they just, yeah. they, uh, they help you get to that point where you can go. Uh, I, yeah. I think you're right that any, any good mentoring relationship is not spoon feeding you information. Right. It's yeah. pointing you to the grocery store and telling yeah. directions how to get there. And then you can go gorge yourself on that information or be like, I'm actually not that hungry and I need to go to a different store. Yeah. One, one, <laughs> one concrete example of that was I was learning how to, um, how to make PCBs and how to um, use stencils and put solder paste on. And, and I was getting a lot of solder bridges. Um, you know, oh, I was getting a low yield in, <laughs> in terms of the results. And, and Bill's like, Hey, um, when you look at your solder paste, are, are the parts of the solder on the pads touching each other ever? You know, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, well, and Bill, Bill said, you know, he, he basically, <laughs> that's, looks, that's bad. That's yeah, bad. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I thought from my, just when I was looking at uh, the whole reflow thing, I thought it was like this magical thing that took care of everything for you. Right. All your, right. all your components just swap into place or whatever. Right. Due to tension. Can, can you, ex- can you quickly explain reflow for people who don't, don't, don't know what it is? Oh, okay. 
Yeah, so it's essentially, so if you go back to just like through hole stuff, you would be using um, solder that comes on a wire and a, and a soldering iron, and you would be melting the solder in place. I think everyone, when they think of solder, right, that's that's the, at least the mental image that comes to my mind sure, is yeah, yeah. someone with a soldering iron uh, doing a through hole thing. Reflow is, is basically you have like a, um, a PCB, um, I have one line right here somewhere. Okay. But essentially you, you have like little, uh, here's one over here. Yeah. I'll hold this up for the people who can see and you have That's lo right. lots yeah. of pads on it. Right. Um, yeah. and essentially you put, um, solder paste on the pads and the paste is essentially, uh, flux mixed with, I, I would say little tiny solder balls in there. That's right. Uh, right. so it's like this nice, um, pasty mixture that's got some stickiness to it, right? <laughs> so when you go to put when you go to put the components on there, they stick. They stay in That's place right. roughly. You could even, I yep. think you probably can turn the board upside down. I don't know. They stick well yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. There's surface uh, tension for sure. Yeah, there's surface tension. And sometimes that that uh, allows you to get away with something. Yeah, the smaller yeah. the part, the, the easier it is uh, yeah. for them to Yeah, exactly. Out. A big honk and thing will fly right off. That's but right, it holds yeah. it in place well enough so that you can then take that thing and put it under heat either. Typically, it's an oven, right? You mm -hmm. Like a pizza yeah. oven kind of like slides through. And, yep, yep. Yeah, and it goes through a cert certain heating profile. But effectively, it melts that solder that's in that solder paste. Uh, and then when it cools back down, the things are on there good, right? Yeah. Yeah. The surface tension, again, it really impacts because say you have like a multi-pin uh, part like you were showing on there, like a six, SOIC 816. Yeah. Actually, each each pin has its own uh, surface tension. And the nice thing is because there's it's pulling in all directions, it uh, it kind of writes itself. And it sounds like that's what you thought was the was always okay. going to happen. Yeah. And Bill said, well, yeah, but unless you have so much paste, it blobs it all together. Yes. Yeah, and even even uh, I was looking at um, there's another board around here that had I don't know what the name for it is a QFN maybe forty eight. Um, okay, and yeah. it's like okay, so it's kind of like this escalation of starting off from like big honking pads that are on on the ESP thirty two chip, which is like yeah. uh, I don't these are like this is a um, castellated edge. It's castellated, got, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's the name of the the pad. So it's, it's actually like, like a, another circuit board with with pads kind of cut up the side. It's like you took a through hole and um, and you basically cut it in half. And that allows you to uh, that allows you to uh, get to the point where now it's cut in half, and you have like a, a half a cylinder, and then the solder can travel up that half cylinder and get to get to a um, basically solder down to a pad that's on the, the board below that you're trying to mount it to. Yeah, and so like the normal the normal pin pitch on things is I guess one tenth of an inch for like breadboard things or or pin headers, right. yep. and this thing that we were just now talking about with the castellated edge is half that. Um, and, and, uh, so I remember when I, the first time I did one of those, it was like, oh man, this is small, you know, <laughs> how can I, how can I, and I was doing it by hand, right. With the soldering iron and trying to, trying to yep. do it without messing up. So, um, so that's when I, when I said the word escalation, I meant like going through smaller and smaller sizes and getting down oh, yeah. to like, you know, the first time I did like a, uh, one of those SOIC eights, you know, it's yeah, like, man, this right. is even smaller. How you think, you think, yeah, exactly. It seems like the smallest thing in the world. And then you but you don't even know about 0402 and 0201s and yeah. and they keep going down from there. So, yeah, so I ran uh, into one chip that um, was a uh, QFN 48, I think might be the right number of pins on it. And that thing just looked ridiculous. It's like- It had yeah. no leads, right? Just No uh, leads, yeah, it was yeah. flat. <laughs> And yep, I'm like, yep. so that was a, that was a great thing where I'm like, hey, Bill, is this possible for a human to do <laughs> by hand? Or, you know, or any he, he basically said, yeah, if you're careful and you get the solder paste, you know, you can you can do it basically. That So it's part of a mentor is just being encouraging, I guess. Right. And saying like, yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah. I think giving, you know, giving some reference points or context for like, <laughs> yes, it is. But here's the steps you need to take. And I think then pointing at like, here are the pitfalls. Right. Because I think. Yeah. When I when I have, when I look at so like I've been doing more RF stuff and and uh, and learning in that space, and I just uh, I didn't know what the pitfalls were, and so mm -hmm. everything looks like a pitfall. And so first off, that's very discouraging, I think. Yes. And then uh, and then the once you have if you have someone that's pointing out, it's like oh actually yes, this is a very real pitfall. You should watch out for that. It's like okay, I'll avoid that. And then uh, and then they point you in the direction of like, but here's some resources then you you basically now have you have a map and again you have to mm -hmm. you know walk that path yourself but maybe you can go and stop and ask for directions along the way if you're getting lost again but but having that map is really really important to i think staying motivated getting getting mm -hmm. uh momentum and then moving towards your goal 
Yeah, there's even one small other concrete example when, when I was talking about if you if you do a bad job of using the stencil to put the paste on and you have like things that will lead to solder bridges, the, the very the simplest thing that Bill told me is wipe it off and try again. Yeah, right. And I was like, yeah. my, my initial reaction to that is like, I would never waste the solder that I just, you know, I'm, I'm too cheap. <laughs> I don't wanna, yeah, yeah, well. But it's like, well, the amount of time you're going to spend fixing it afterwards is going to cost you money in terms of time. So yeah, yeah that, that little thing, it's like, uh, I don't want to say no one ever says that when you're reading about the stuff online or if you're ever watching YouTube videos, but I never did see that before. I, was, I never saw anyone like wipe it off and try again. And Bill just came out and said that right away. And that, mm. that solved a lot of my solder bridge problems. Yeah, right. Exactly. Again, as you, you wouldn't know to, <laughs> you wouldn't search for like, do I wipe off the solder paste? But uh, you know, when you, when you have someone to just guide you down that path, it really, it can really help a lot. So yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the, okay, so you're coming okay. in from the software side. Can you okay. tell us a little bit how you, and you mentioned you're using ClojureScript on the Raspberry Pi, yeah, but first yeah. off, can you explain what ClojureScript is and then how that has kind of played into the hardware okay, that you've yeah. been building? Yeah, so um, so ClojureScript is, um, it's a programming language. Um, it's actually a dialect of Clojure, um, and it, um, whereas Clojure is like a JVM Java-based thing, uh, Clojure and ClojureScript are both um they're like hosted languages. They they sit on top of either Java or JavaScript. Um, hmm. uh, well, I luckily but, get to play yeah. the dummy here today okay, because so, uh, I am software challenged. Okay, sometimes. so so if you think <laughs> uh, the best way I would try to describe it to you is um, if you let's say you're you're working on building some some board and you needed an amplifier, right? You could go all the way to the bottom and you could say, oh, I'm just going to build this out of transistors, right? You sure. Or yep. you could say, I'm going to get a, an amplifier IC. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and just use, use something at a higher level of abstraction, right? And as far as programming languages go, you have things like assembly and C at the bottom of this stack of abstraction. And if you go higher and higher up, ultimately you get to these Lisp-like languages that are way up in the clouds, you know, but they're, it's, it's kind of like very abstract and, and very, um, very easy to get through things because of that abstraction. A lot of the stuff is dealt with for you. Um, okay. If, if you've ever, uh, if you've ever dealt with like tools like MATLAB, MATLAB is sure. a, okay. So MATLAB, think about how it like makes it so you can represent a matrix very easily. Yeah. Um, and if you compared MATLAB to something like if you had to do that in Fortran, <laughs> no, you know, right. so, so, oh yeah, Fortran can fly, but man, it's going to take you a lot longer to code something like that in Fortran. Right. So, that's, so what, what is, what is the, uh, so then is it targeted at specific industries or specific problems that these, uh, these kind of structures are built for? So like, is it built for the web? Is it built for oh, processing okay. so, stuff? Yeah. So closure, closure and closure script are, are just high level general languages that you can use for practically okay. anything. Uh -huh. Um, but you know, th the challenge is, um, getting these these languages to run in different environments and that's where uh you know for for quite a while there was just closure on the jvm and closure script was created because uh the fact that javascript pretty much runs everywhere right mm -hmm. or runs in the browser and um there is a project named esprurino that actually puts oh, yeah. javascript onto chips yeah, I've actually seen that one. Okay, yeah. so so it turns out, and that and that class of things, uh, the probably the most popular one is uh, Micro Python. It's, okay, it's the idea where you can run a high level language directly on the chip. Uh, yeah, in yeah. in real. So time. that means like the the interpreter is like living on the chip as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it turns out, since Closure Script, um, Closure Script is uh, as basically you could think of it as like a transpiler. Uh, or it's, it basically is a language that when you compile it, it takes this Lisp-like language and converts it to JavaScript that can then run hmm. in a browser or run in Esperino. Um, huh. So it's almost like a level above JavaScript then? It seems like that would be very... I would, I would argue it is, yeah. I, don't, yeah. I would argue it's a higher level. You have higher level constructs, much like MATLAB is a higher level, you know, more abstract thing than Fortran. You know? Yeah, and you could uh, people could argue about this all day endlessly, but that's that's <laughs> and they I, do. This is the internet, Mike. Come on. Oh man, yeah. So so it's kind of like uh, it, my opinion is you should pick the most abstract tool you can to get the job done, and uh -huh. only reach deeper when some you know you something's not working and you have to open up the hood and go deeper and and mm -hmm. and, and so um and and for the chip world things like Closure Script or, or MicroPython, they're at this place where like they can be useful for certain problems, you know, where you don't need the utmost in speed or, you know, it, because it, there's an interpreter, like you said, it's running this stuff uh, so that, you know, you're, you're making trade-offs. You're getting like higher level programming constructs uh, and, it, and you can code faster, 
but the result is going to run a little bit more slow rather than if you had like mm. written it directly in C. Got it. Yeah. So then how does this all play together? So are you trying to, and then go and put this onto like an actual, so Clojure script now running, you mentioned on a Raspberry Pi, but it's um, also running on other yeah, things. Yeah. So that's, that's, um, that was this, uh, so I had made, so I was, this was kind of like a project of mine and, and it also was like useful at work was just to experiment and explore running Clojure script on, um, a chip. And it turns out that, um, to do this, you need a lot of Ram. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, this this is an ESP thirty two that has like oh man I want to say like what is it megabytes of RAM at least you know it's mm. it's crazy yeah, I think four meg four meg maybe yeah yeah and it's like or maybe that's the flash actually I don't know that's, uh, it that is might kind be of the flash it's, on it's, uh, it's um there there is uh there's like uh God I want to say that it's spy RAM so there's a there is some some sort of thing that's off the chip that's giving you extra RAM. Mm -hmm. But, okay. but the cool thing is it's like, it's enough, <laughs> it's enough RAM to run this really high level language and actually, um, establish what you would call a REPL into it. REPL mm. stands for read eval print loop. Um, uh -huh. if you have right. Python, you have a, the same thing, like a REPL there where you're, you're basically jacked in and you can type commands. It's almost like, uh, if, if you ever had like experienced basic computers, like, yeah, they could have exactly. heard like the Commodore, you know, yeah. on the Commodore 64 flip that thing on, you're in a REPL, right? You can type things into it right away and yeah. you get that immediate feedback and, and gratification and that loop. Mm -hmm. And and frustration when you type something wrong too. Don't oh yeah, that. right away, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it's it, it's really useful. I've actually done that with CircuitPython and MicroPython. MicroPython's on the ESP32. I've done okay. that with CircuitPython as well, which is on some of the CMD stuff and that's more sponsored by the Adafruit folks. Um, yeah, and it, it is really useful for kind of throwing commands at things and trying them out, like especially if you're trying to talk to a particular chip. Yeah, I find that that's uh, okay. really useful for like prototyping and things like that. Oh yeah. So, All right. so yeah. how does it work for um, for what you're trying to do now? So you, you've now built a REPL for the ESP32 yeah. to yeah. run Clojure Script. Mm -hmm. Does it again? Does it have like kind of function specific things that you're capable of doing? in yes. closure scripts so, or so what like, are you trying to do with it? Yeah. Like if you were, if like you were trying to mess around with something and you're like, ah, oh, I just want to try, you know, I want to send some, some spy commands, some other to another chip that's on the board or whatever. And you're trying to mess around. Fortunately, Esperino is the answer to a lot of that. Esperino and its JavaScript implementation has like all the hooks you need to like get at the hardware from the higher level. Um, mm -hmm. So like uh, on this particular board, there's like, um, there's GPIO pins that you can you can get at, and and all that's done. Uh, kudos to Esperino; it's built this entire environment, you know, mm -hmm. and JavaScript where you can just at a really abstract level just say, "Hey, flip this thing this way," or do pulse width mod modulation on a certain pin, you know pin and have it yeah, flash right, for you. Right. Right. Um, and and from the closure script level, uh, closure script has a way to kind of like make it fairly straightforward to do JavaScripty kind of things to interact at the next layer down. Um, Got it. So you can. So it's almost like it's like a pass through then. So it's written like Clojure script, but it basically is doing similar stuff to what the Esperino JavaScript implementation yeah. would be doing. Yep. You could imagine like if you if you slapped Esperino on there and you were messing around uh, doing the same thing, and Clojure script is roughly the same thing. You're just using a different language instead of using JavaScript. You're using Clojure script. Huh. Just at a different okay. level. Yeah. That's great. So, yeah. so what are you using this thing for? Are you just using it to kind of hack around and yeah. try different things? Or, yeah. So, or what? so it's. For, uh, at work, um, it would be just using it to prototype, exactly like you said, um, to, to try to figure out things whenever it's a faster way to get to things. Um, but in the end, like if you're going to put an actual chip into a car or whatnot, or certain use cases, you you then have to like be pragmatic and you have to say, well, maybe this is, you know, maybe we're not there yet in terms of like the speeds needed or or mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's like you exactly said, the same arguments would apply maybe to uh, MicroPython or or any of these these like high level languages, they're great for yeah. prototyping, and they have their uses. And maybe as maybe another decade from now, it'll just be useful for everything because all these chips will be so fast, right? And, right, know. right. Yeah, I think that we are benefiting from the you know from the explosion of you know available micros and uh, and processing power that's out there. It's just that the the real problem is that if you want it to run off a battery, it's usually going to be kind of kind of tough to do that. Or yeah, you know, yeah. And that's 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 okay. So that. Part of why I did this was to learn, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, 
I, everything. Like I wanted to learn how to make a PCB, uh, mm -hmm. and I wanted I I basically made it so that it's uh, I'm holding up the board again, showing that it's connected yeah. to a light bulb. I wanted to learn how to do like battery charging circuitry, yeah, um, yeah. and and perhaps get it wrong or whatever. You know, the only way to find out is to try it at a certain point and just dig into it and read the data yeah. sheets and figure out like God, oh, that matter? Even yeah. even uh, in, in the background, I have an oven, <laughs> so I learned how. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. I you learned how own, to do uh, that. So I, I is that a Control Leo 2 on there or what's, yeah. what do you This, this is a Control Leo 2 or actually a Control Leo 3. And yeah. it was it was built for me by Bill Hurd. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> he, very he's, nice. he's like, yeah, perhaps going to get into making these things. So, and that That's was great. that just that was another thing I wanted to learn was how to how to do that. So so for me, I took I took this thing and I, you know, I, I gave a talk about it and I and I slapped the thing up on Tindy so people could get, get it. And that gave me an opportunity to like use the oven. Right. Like yeah, I'm yeah. not going to make like a lot of these for myself. But if, you know, if people are getting them off Tindy, then that gives me an excuse yeah. to like, and I learned nothing, a lot. Nothing like commerce to really get your, uh, get your motivation up. Huh? And like, it was well, like, oh, wow, someone paid me for this. I better go build some and so, make sure they work. Yeah. So it makes you, it makes you worry. Am I going to like burn someone's house down if I build a board that, you know, is not doing the right thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Or it makes you worry about a lot of stuff. Like you're going to give something to another human being that, you know, you're letting this thing go into the world <laughs> and you want to make sure that, so that, yes, you're right. That. That puts you in a whole different mindset. We're like, mm. uh, not only does this have to work, but it has to work without me around to keep it working, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, manufacturing is its own, uh, you know, it's its own discipline, and the manufacturing engineers out there are shaking their heads or nodding their heads rather and saying, "Yeah, it's not, it's not easy." So uh, it's, I think there, there is a, there is a chasm from like, you know, building your first one to building your hundredth one. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, and it's, but it's a fun, a fun bit of challenge. So. Um, what, what else were some of the challenges as you were getting to those prototypes in those first early units? What, what were you, what did you run into? Uh, most Cause I'm particularly interested in like the, yeah. the, the perspective of someone who's coming from the software world, right? Yeah. It seems like, you know, and, and maybe even specifically at a high level language kind of thing, like mm -hmm. some of this stuff under the hood is maybe taken care of you for, for you. Like, okay, yeah. I'm sure that someone with your experience, you know, you have to dig down and okay, build, yeah. build other, build other stuff up, but like, um, my experience has always been with hardware. You're, you know, you basically it stops at the silicon usually, but you know, from there on up, you're in charge of making things are hooked together properly, and there's not many guardrails to getting things right. Yeah, yeah. Oops. So, let's see. So, uh, so this actually was not the first uh, prototype I made. I made another one before this to learn, you know, some mistakes from. Uh, <laughs> I was one say only two. That's that's not bad, Mike. Well, one <laughs> thing I learned uh, is I was. For some reason, I was obsessed with making things very small and compact mm. on the board, and yep. like trying to come like, oh, this new world of uh, surface mount stuff. Since it is small, why don't I just cram it into like as small geometry sure. as I can? And yeah. I learned, oh, that's not well. At least from my limited experience so far, that was not a good result. <laughs> you know, uh, right. I, I ended up getting a um, I got like a linear regulator that was like, I didn't realize how small it was until it came back from DigiKey. It was uh -huh. like yep. two millimeters. By two millimeter square. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. They make them. They make them real tiny if you if you're not careful. And and the problem is too. I feel like the when you're on a DigiKey or Mauser, like the the preview size. You know, every part yeah. looks about the same size. And then you know, one's like one's the size of your fist, and the other one's the size of your you know the, the grain of sand. So yeah, it's not not fun. And that sometimes. little so that little thing like was a pain to get to work. Like I you know yeah. I would have to solder it on, and, and I didn't have an oven at the point. I, I was using a hot air thing to try to get mm -hmm. it on there and. And, and even after I got it to work, if I put my finger on it, that thing was hot. You know, <laughs> I don't know if it, like the thermal properties of it weren't necessarily right. So I just got a sure, big sure. honking linear regulator and put it on there. That was mm -hmm. one lesson I learned, you know, just all types of little things of how, you know, you have to almost just do it to learn like how to avoid, like I was mentioning solder bridges and, and, um, and I, I'm sure oh, there's even things I'm learning now. Like I probably screwed up all this signal integrity stuff, right. In terms of like, sure. like sure. I, you know, uh, like I have traces going overlapping each other and stuff like that. You know, uh -huh. I'm now reading the the Bogotin books and like oh, okay, making yeah. me feel bad. Like, oh man, I got, but that's, you have to like, if you, if you don't have something that you built, you can't think back to that and think, oh, did that's I do right. that part right? <laughs> right, right. Well, it's kind of like we talked about. It's like, uh, so you go and read a signal integrity book Yeah. and I was very much like this, you know, you, I go to start reading one and it basically, for me, it was like going to aardvark in the dictionary where it was i didn't, I didn't okay. know what i was talking you need some about. context to like yeah exactly and what but once you've built a board and you're like why is my why is my serial line not working if i'm above 96 
you know, 9,600 baud, it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe you should make loop-de-loops in your board, Chris. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and then you start to learn these things and, though. And then it yeah. is this kind of push pull of like, well, it worked this time, it didn't work this time. And you need a lot of, a lot of trial and error there. And, and to me, the whole, the idea of inductance and all that is so non-intuitive. Like mm. I, I was a mechanical engineer and I, you know, it's like things I can grasp and understand the, the select electrical stuff that you can't see. Uh, mm. it's, I guess we all fall back on just analogs of how, you know, how that stuff works and, and just loop inductance and all that stuff is still like at the periphery of my ability to grok and, and, and mm. even understand what I'm doing wrong, you know, when I design a board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, how did the mechanical stuff play in that? Like, well, first off, when okay. did you, when did you switch from mechanical to the software side? Oh yeah. That, so I didn't know what I was going to be when I was a kid, you know, so I, I was, oh. uh, I was influenced by like the, the Apollo stuff and rockets and building, you know, machines. And, and to me, the closest thing to that was, you know, mechanical engineering and it's like stuff you could grasp, you know, uh, and, and, and even aerospace engineering is just something much more readily graspable for me at least. And electronics has always been this thing of like, it's like this mysterious world of stuff you can't see. Right. And it's dangerous too. You don't want to touch it because it kill you. Right. Um, well, yeah, some, sometimes, sometimes you know, yeah. low voltage is a little safer. Yeah. yeah. You know, st- stay below five volts and you're going to be just fine. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. So I had, I had, I had pretty much ignored electronics my whole life. You know, I, I knew that it existed and had heard all the terms that we always hear, but never, never mm-hmm. like dug into learning it. Um, mm. but, uh, and so, but that got you into the software side as well as the electronics. Oh, uh, so, okay. So, the um, software for me, so so when I was growing up, the two big things that, that really like influenced me were the Apollo things, <laughs> Apollo missions, and mm-hmm. these computers you could buy, the, the Commodore 64 and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. These things rocked my world, right? You know, here, here we have people going to the moon, and you could get a computer in your house, and you could control your TV set. You could type something into it, and it would do something that like was right. logical, and it would... So, right. so I was always hooked on both from the beginning, and it's just... That's an example of the world that you're living in. Having great things like that available to you can really influence you when you're young. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, it sounds like changing your environment in general. Like that's, I feel like that's still the magical gateway for people getting started. It's like the easy example is like an LED, like lighting up an LED is like immediately changing your environment with not much consequence, but like, boy, does it still feel magical, especially when you're towards the beginning of your you know, electronics journey. Yeah, yeah. So I guess like um, with with all these things, ultimately you have to control something to, to make it meaningful, right? Otherwise mm-hmm. it's just generating heat on a board. Um, so so yeah, just uh, definitely the stuff that I'm doing at work, actually like walking out with my iPhone and pushing a button on it or with an Apple Watch or, and, you know, and, and then my car just unlocks, right? It's like, yeah, that um, that's, that's cool to be able to control the world that you live in. And for me, I guess electronics to me is like all these things that I, thought were coming from somewhere else um, or that were out of my reach, like even like something like a remote control for your TV set. Once you realize you can build that yourself too, it's like so empowering, right? You're like, Mm -hmm. if I want one of these, I can make it. There's nothing to stop you at that point from like dreaming up something cool to build. And that's just intoxicating, right? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Agency. Agency is a, is a, is a powerful tool, I think. And, you know, wanting to be able to go change your environment and being like, yeah, that's, it's pretty cheap. And it, that's the other thing. I think it's just so cheap now compared to how it used to be. I mean, getting yeah. even a Ben Eater, you know, style computer from Ben Eater, like the parts, it's like, you know, a couple hundred bucks to build up this thing and have a whole bunch of parts that you can go and work on. You know? one, one thing along those lines, this is a, this is uh, one cool thing we've been getting into at work is UWB. And this even like, uh, this is even exciting Bill. Bill Heard mm. because it's UWB like, like, a, like an ultra wideband? Yes, or? exactly. Okay. Ultra wideband. Um, mm. And and the cool thing about it, um, you almost have to experience this yourself. Where it, it so the the thing that it does do is it can measure distances to other UWB chips by mm-hmm. by sending a, a pulse of ultra wideband signal that's got a timestamp on it that's really accurate. It's got like yep. it's got like a uh, I guess like gigahertz clock and running inside of it, and the counter is mm-hmm. zipping up in it like and it's it's fast enough to put an accurate enough timestamp on it, so you can actually use the speed of light. To, yeah. to measure the round trip as it comes back. And you can actually like uh, measure things like down to the centimeter level, centimeter level accuracy. So yeah, you can like, yeah. you can set up a locker on your car and like you can move this towards it. And there's this invisible barrier that you can cross. Yeah. And I know that this, this stuff is cool to me, but I noticed like when my kids look at it and they're like, what? 
you know, they see like, yeah. you know, like they, they imagine like there's an invisible bubble around your car. I'm like, That's exactly. Right. Yeah. There's, and yeah. it's so cool to be able to like actually put that stuff together. And, and I think arguably you have to delve into electronics to be able to like assemble things like that or put it together. Like if you're just going to stick in the software world, you can do awesome things there too. But like sure, if sure. you, if you start to like dig into this stuff as well, you can make things that like, even your kids are like astonished with you. Like, like, well, I feel like RF has its own particular brand of magic because it's it's not, it's not just it's not just an LED where you like flip a switch over here and an LED comes on because you can see it's physically connected. It's like yeah. you flip a switch over here and then like across the room the LED goes on. It's like oh wow okay now yes. something's something's happening you know. <laughs> yeah yeah and that's so that's where I'm at now in terms of like the cool peripheral edge is just like the del dipping my toe into the RF pool. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've got myself a little VNA and, mm -hmm. and Bill's been digging into that too. He's got, a, you know, even higher end VNAs and it's like, just, all, it's all like, you know, you, when you're designing a board um, and, and you're dealing with logic gates, that's one way of looking at everything. But then when you're dealing with RF, it's a whole different world, right? Like mm -hmm. the stuff doesn't even, the, the electricity evidently doesn't even flow through the conductors. It's like on the, on the skin, on the surface and, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, effect. Yep. yeah. And like, you can't like you have, my oscilloscope can't measure any of this stuff. It's gone so fast. Mm -hmm. It's like, and, and I, you know, I mentioned that to Bill and he's like, yeah, that's Bill's like, yeah, my entire life, everything that's new that comes out, none of the gear you have can measure it. You know, <laughs> it's like, you're always like delving into new you're things. Always, you're always a couple of seasons behind. Yeah. It's... Yeah. Yeah. And I guess even for, for Bill back in, in the, in the eighties or whatever with TTL chips, even like oscilloscopes were just able to measure stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, now we're in this world where you need a dedicated DNA device to measure mm -hmm. what it's doing. And, and for me, it's like another whole interesting set of things to learn um, with with respect to wave propagation and all that kind of stuff. That's just like very intellectually stimulating, you know, and yeah. and it yeah. actually you can measure it. It's not just like stuff you read in a book. You can put it together and hook up your VNA and you can say like, oh, man. So one example of that was I, I built a um, uh, like a. I wasn't making this myself, but I was like copying a reference design and I laid out like an, a, an antenna matching network between um, a BLE capable chip and the actual antenna that it would go out. And I just like laid it out in a pretty straightforward way. And Bill looked at that and he's like, you probably want to like make that all smaller and close together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and I did that um, and, and respun another board with it smaller and, and then measured it with a VNA. And I could see like so much, you know, when you, I was doing like the Smith start smith chart stuff right and and you could see that the that the um thing stayed right in the center of the smith chart whereas with that larger initial design i did mm -hmm. the smith chart was all it's, over the place yeah right? loopy 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 yeah 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 and it's like yeah and smith charts are kind of their own thing i didn't i actually didn't realize you were getting all, uh, into that side of uh inside just that just, side of just putting my toe into it right and, yeah, and, yeah and that's arguably that's stuff that even bill heard is finding intellectually stimulating at his point in his career he's like yeah, mm -hmm. there, yeah there's right. like some really weird stuff that goes on when you start to deal with yeah. rf and um, it's it's not like uh, you can't just say, oh, if I hook these two wires together, like I said, like it worked. The first design I did, actually, I was able to um, connect up and do BLE with it. It worked. But the game right. was probably, you know. Right. Off. Yeah. You get yeah. you just get to the edge of the table instead of across the room. And uh, yeah, that's I think that's that's the other nice thing is that there's the chips are so, um, so well designed and like tolerant of uh, my my mistakes that, <laughs> oh, that they still yeah. work enough. And it's like, oh, okay, well, that's a, that's a good start. And, that, that uh, and then you can start to optimize. Just think of how tolerant this stuff is. I had, I, there's a, a, a connector standard called IPX or UFL. Um, it's like mm -hmm. a little, I don't know if I have one of these around here, but it's like when you have an antenna and you snap it onto your board, there's like that's a little right. tiny, they're kind of annoying. Right. They're, actually, they're actually coaxial. I, um, it's basically because you have like a cup and then there's a center pin that's coming up out of the cup. And okay. This is like flat against the board. And then on the other side, there is now a coaxial cable that then kind of has like a sucker that goes down over that center pin. And then the rest kind of sucks down around the, the cup, the outside of the cup. And that's the center pin is the conductor and the outside is the ground. Okay. So I, I had, I had soldered my UFL thing on backwards. Oh yeah. That'll so do like, it. Yeah. So like the ground, the ground end was hooked to the RF transmission line. Yep. I'm yep. like, how, how did this even work? And Bill's like, well, your entire board was probably radiating RF. That that's time. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the ground yeah. plane was radiating, and that's how you're. Yeah. I'm like, oh man, that sounds bad because all of it's reflecting back into the chip, and yeah. Yeah. Ah. yeah sometimes I, I wish there was like a way to actually visualize like in real time, like from like 
eyeglasses to like see what you know RF fields are doing within a certain band. It's that would be that would be the ultimate way to like visualize and start to like get more into. I mean, it's all down to intuition. So um, yeah, have and you... it sounds like that's what you're building as well as someone coming from the software world into the electronics world. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're building up these intuitive models to start to to see to see things clearly and and. And that's what Bill's kind of giving you as, as a mentor. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely that intuition is like, if I push on this thing here, will it move over there? <laughs> and yeah, right. it's like, you have to build that, like when you're designing something, you, there's no way to start from just raw yeah. formulas and calculations. You have to have intuition and yeah. a high level. Well, and I feel like that's a big piece of uh, troubleshooting as well, right? So troubleshooting is all about, you know, experience, I think, right? And so that's what something that a mentor can really help is to basically lend you their experience. Mm -hmm. And then intuition is like, uh, you know, well, I think there's also a rigor element as well of like, okay, I wanted to try to change this one thing and then see, does it, does it do anything down the line? No, it doesn't. Okay. I'll go back to the first beginning and I'll, I'll start to iterate and try it again, iterate, try it again, iterate, try it again. But then the intuition is, uh, okay, now the fourth thing I tried, I wiggled the connector here and it started working. Your intuition starts to build and say, oh, there may be a connection problem or there may be, maybe I hooked the ground into the connector or the conductor yeah, rather. Yeah, and yeah. right. And, uh, yeah, it's, but it's building that over time. So like, yeah. as you've been building mm -hmm. your intuition, mm -hmm. are there any like models that pop out to you that you you didn't have six months ago or a year ago or, or, or you know, at, at the beginning? Well, um, one thing you just said reminded me of, of something that wasn't obvious to me right away, which is um, when, you're, when you're building these things, it is always good when it fails. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. That's your chance to learn. <laughs> and, and I think that's where I've learned almost every, you know, like if it works the first time, uh, did you really learn anything? I guess, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, it worked, but it, maybe it's only working on accident. Right. Um, right. 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 And when it fails, then you're like, then that's your opportunity to start digging deeper and like, what, what's going on? What did I miss? What part did I hook up wrong? Uh -huh. Um, yep. and that, that to me, uh, it's, it's the same thing with programming. You just have to do it and have something fail. Um, and then that cause, causes your gears to start turning. You're like, why is this failing? And, right. and you do need to like rely on intuition to, to see from the big picture, like what could be causing this, you know? Mm -hmm. it, and sometimes you can't, you can't even see what's doing it because it might be a solder bridge underneath a chip or something. And you have right. to start probing around and like thinking mental model, building up metal models like, okay, if this is doing this, then that must imply something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, or yeah. you, you're wrong and you go down that path and you find out that's not it. And you, yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's that's pretty much uh, one thing I've learned in general is just the 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 fact that you learn the most when things fail, <laughs> which that's, that's been true for me. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's I, I think, you know, we talked a little bit about earlier about like knowing what to Google for as well. And mm -hmm. like, uh, even though it can get a little confusing as you dive down that rabbit hole and like trying to mm -hmm. figure out what all of the the different uh, variations of your problems can be like seeing all of them and then starting to hone in on home in, hone in, mm -hmm. uh, on the, uh, on the actual problem, it can really start to, uh, kind of broaden, broaden your, your scope of what's out there and what, uh, is a possible error. But then when you start mm -hmm. to actually figure out what it is, you, you start to see, and it's, especially if you see it a second time, mm -hmm. then you start to see, okay, now there's these, these models of, of things that could go wrong and did go wrong in your case. And, yeah. and then you kind of file away in a library that you can look at the next time. One example is where my intuition was completely wrong or my mental model was completely wrong, which is when you have a, um, a signal going down a trace from, you know, from one chip to another. Mm -hmm. um, my mental model was that um, it would send the signal there and then, um, then the return path would involve, it's kind of like the same thing going backwards, right? Along mm -hmm. the return path. And, along um, the same line or, or no, saying... along, along the, maybe along the ground. And I understood, I understood enough at the point, at that point that it actually would follow it right underneath, mm. like, like the, um, what's it, the path of least inductance or, or path of least. Well, impedance. yeah, usually people think um, resistance at first, but it, it, it is truly impedance. So like if you have uh, a high inductance path, it's going to be like, ah, I don't, I don't want to go there either. So, <laughs> so the mental model that I had wrong was I would imagine like, oh, you would send a signal and it would propagate out to the chip. And then my mental model was that the return would be like kind of a similar wave going back the opposite way. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that it was happening as the signal went out, like the entire time it's like coming backwards. And I didn't mm -hmm. get that to be honest until Bill showed me a video of it, you know, a, mm -hmm. a visualization that someone had made showing, uh, 
the field strengths and whatnot as the signal. Propagated. Oh yeah, was it the one where like you actually see the uh, the, the like the heat map as lots as, of like, colors the, the, and lots of little yeah arrows. fields are growing and shrinking. Yeah, those yeah. are magical and, things. And, that's kind of the close. That's kind of what I imagined when I talked about just having glasses to see fields. Yes, and that would be if you could do that live through like some kind of smart glasses. That would be like the best case scenario. But like the amount of processing that even took, it probably took you know two hours to render that video. <laughs> yeah, and it's based on static data. But so, it, yeah. it was shocking to me because I was like, oh man. I've been thinking about this the wrong way the entire time. Mm -hmm. And then once I yeah. saw that with my own eyes, I'm like, like within half a second, I realized I was wrong. And I'm sure. like, now I have this new mental model. Sure. You sure. Have to well, see it. I, I think the other tro troublesome thing is that it, uh, it changes. Some of that behavior can change at different frequencies as well. Right. So if you have a really yeah. low, slow analog signal, it might actually, you know, take a meandering path back or something, but yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah uh, thinking about electricity, it's, it really is a lot in our heads and you know electrons are going to do whatever they want to do uh sometimes they'll just go yeah. off and radiate into the you know okay see you later electron now you're you're uh e emi uh and uh yeah it's just it's uh it's a crazy crazy world out there of of how how this stuff works and that's 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 the place where i'm at now where i struggle with is like when you're building something and you you know these rules that you've been reading about and whatnot and you're like well i probably shouldn't do that and then it's it's I struggle with like, how do I know that this is actually going to work? And I, I've never like gone down the path of actually like saying, okay, let's simulate this board with, with a, mm. you know, software. To, mm. I'm still at this place where I'm like, I'm just building the thing and trying it and seeing if it works. And if it comes back, yeah. maybe probing it to try to figure out or try to visualize. Sure. I, yeah. I'm not so, at that point. So you're where, basically yeah. taking advantage of kind of the low cost hardware and you're just saying it's worth my time to go and just build it and get it done and, and try it. Yeah, that's just that's just the level of where I'm at in terms of my expertise right now. I, I you know, I think that's a I, great way to do it. Honestly, I mean, I think there's, yeah. it's it's you know, especially if it's for a non, you know, even if it is for a work project, and but you have that oh, ability yeah. to yeah. go spend time on it. It's like, yeah, you're gonna really be able to dig in and, and learn a lot that way. Yeah, a lot of these things that I'm working on now, they just have to, um, they just have to fundamentally work from like a prototype standpoint. It's not like mm -hmm. I'm building something that's that millions of them are being made. Right, you know, duct tape and bubble gum is fine as long as it uh, yeah. as, it, as long as it gets through the demo and you can show it to someone and it works there. But if you can if you can invent those magical glasses that would let me even see sure, what the board sure. is yeah. doing, I think I'm gonna I'm the first pair. But after that, you you can okay. be a second yeah. pair. Mike. Well, we'll we'll do we'll do a Kickstarter or something. You know, like we'll just really. I think they'll be popular amongst they, like other, the like glasses people. will slow down time and you can see the wave propagate sure. and you can yeah. see it. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why not? They're magical glasses. They can do whatever we want. You know. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So what are you building now? I mean, so you've built this board, you have the ESP32 board that you built and you yeah. design and you're sell you're still selling? Yes, yep, it's still up on okay. Tendi, yeah. So we'll have a yeah. link to that. Yeah. Um, uh, what what are you building next? So, what is your, so the, your next So the journey? stuff that I'm digging into at work now all surrounds this UWB stuff. Um, Got it. And, um, you know, learning how to um, how to control the RF on those things. So one, one interesting thing that's happened is uh, if you look into the into the ultra wideband world, there seems to be one major vendor, uh, DecaWave, mm. that makes the, the chips. DecaWave. And and all their, have you heard of that company? Uh, no, it no? just sounds like, I just feel like uh, yeah. there's like a room where oh, yeah. like these uh, these names came up and they yes. were all like in the 80s. And, oh yeah. Uh, you know, like Deca, Deca and yeah. Hexa and you know, like, yeah. I, I don't know. I just, yeah. I, 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 it sounds very retro, even though I'm sure they're a very modern company in, in many ways. Oh, so or advanced, you know? So yeah. what's, what's strange is that they, they seem to have like the only, it's kind of weird. The only chips that do this stuff, they're the only game in town to do mm -hmm. ultra wideband. Of course, now Apple has ultra wideband in their own, in the iPhone itself, but you know, mm -hmm. so there, but you can't buy those chips, right? There's, so if you say, right. oh, I want, like, if you say, Hey Chris, you want to go make something with with if you want to mess around with the UWB, you're going right. to be messing with the DecaWave chips, I bet. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and, that makes sense. and and the interesting thing is, is they're all sold out right now. <laughs> oh, all the modules basically are. Yeah. So so now we're working on building like um, you can still get the actual chip. The uh, you can get the, uh, the the processor, if you will. You can't buy uh -huh. the entire module that has the the little UWB antenna on the end and all. Got that. it. Yeah. So like a module versus a chip solution. Module solution would have the antenna on it. It would have the matching components. It would be yeah. like it'd be like buying the Espressif ESP32 chip versus yes. the the uh, what do they call it? The W R O O M. The room. Room. Yeah. Whatever. How you pronounce module that? Module. Yeah. Yes. That has pre-certified for FCC. Yes, it's got FCC on like the lip. Yeah. Yeah, so you can't exactly. buy these right now. Like they're yeah. if you go to DigiKey, they're they're none left. They're I, gone. I have I have yeah. five of them. So I have like that's good. <laughs> Guard them with your life. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I'm so to answer your question, oh, what cool. I'm doing now is just digging into like 
how do you, you know, how do you build stuff with the tri chips directly? How do you like um, measure the round trip times even better? Cause you can use, you know, very basic algorithms to do that, or you can get fancier and fancier, you know, mm -hmm. more, you know, multiple round trips and whatnot. Um, yeah. So that's a, that's what a is fun the, world to live in. Yeah. What is the frequency range of those things you're operating at? Oh, yes. Yeah. It's a, it's up at the higher channels. It's like six gigahertz. So, okay, so cool. the V and I have V and A I have can't go that high. Uh -huh, um, yeah. So I'm like, uh, now I want to drop 10 grand on a V and A. <laughs> oh, don't do it. No. Don't do it. Yeah. You can rent them. That's can, the, that's oh, the thing can? I've learned. Okay. Yeah. You can rent them per week per day. It's not oh, cheap wow. still, but it's yeah. cheaper than owning and you'll get a brand new one that I mean, always works. Yeah. Like you can, so. you can get these Rigol oscilloscopes for like 300 bucks now. It's amazing. Yeah. The stuff you can yeah. buy these days. Mm -hmm. But in the VNA world, no. <laughs> That's yeah. like yeah. It's still it's still a very sliver of the audience. I think as there's more people getting into it, more people oh, okay. like looking at UWB, yeah. I think they'll, you know, do more of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, th so, it'll drive down into the, the lower end. You, you can get like, uh, this is a pocket VNA. And one thing that's all mm -hmm. the rage now is something called the nano VNA. And the that's nano right. VNA yeah. is like 50 bucks. Yep. I don't know how good it is, but it's a VNA, right? It, it's, can, uh, yeah. Well, it's limited to, uh, I think, like 900 megahertz is kind of the top of its range. Okay, yeah. Um, maybe even lower than that. It's, it's definitely uh, popular for the hams that are out there. You can't complain. Um, like, it's 50 bucks. Yeah, Yeah, 50 bucks is like even just to play around with it and, and try <laughs> it out. You can yeah. go and look at how capacitors respond, inductors. I think it actually does help to build mental models. And then, you know, you got to learn Smith charts and things like that. But yeah. to start to build up, you know, these resources, um, there's... Uh, Alan Wolke is a yes. YouTuber. I yeah. love his channel, W2AEW yeah. on yep. YouTube. Uh, I highly recommend that one. He is, uh, he, I think, I, I want to claim that probably a third of everything I understand right now is from his videos. He is okay. so clear, you know, yeah. and, and his explanations of how that, how things work. Right, um, right. There's another one, Tom Tech, uh, Tom Tech Lab, maybe. Uh, okay. I'm trying to remember what it is, but I'll try and link it as well. But there's another one where basically he uses nano VNAs and uh, analog discovery twos, which is how I found it. That's a that's a low cost piece of equipment that's very hard to find okay. right now as well, unfortunately. Ah, uh, yeah. But uh, great for experimenting, and that's what we use for the course as well. Um, so ah. highly recommend those as like. A starter scope as well. Lots yeah, of yeah. I feel like I'm like a ones. kid in a candy store again with the whole VNA oh, yeah. thing. It's like, see, I think, <laughs> I think, Mike, I think you, you, ex you, uh, you represent the the most dangerous uh, demographic here <laughs> yeah, yeah. because you have the uh, the salary of and the backing of a company of a software engineer. Yeah, and then you know the the. the <laughs> predilections to go and buy hardware equipment and boy yeah oh, stay man. off ebay man you, yeah you, i know yeah <laughs> it's a dangerous place you can really yeah you can really put a hole in your burn a hole in your pocket it's it's uh i don't know I i've been buying i actually got a, a notification today that more of my ebay swag has been coming in uh and i just it's just a deep dark hole you can go down and buy more stuff so be careful yeah. my friend yes okay <laughs> so mike right, where can people yeah. find out more about you and maybe uh find your products and uh Talk okay. to you online. Yeah, so so I work for Vouch. Um, Vouch.io is is that company, and I'm also mm -hmm. I I have a unique name like you do, Chris. So you can Google me. I'm Mike Fikes. <laughs> I, yep. I didn't even know what my Twitter ID is. Probably M Fikes. You know, it's M Fikes. Yeah, yeah okay. we've been having Thank it you. flash yeah. across the screen a little bit here. <laughs> All uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's great. So that's yeah. you're on Twitter a lot and like interacting. Yeah. But... Yeah. So I get into the whole closure world. You'll you'll see me talking a lot about that stuff too. So. Yeah. yeah, and you gave yeah. a, you gave a talk recently. You you uh, yes, quickly yeah. referred to it. What what was that at? Um, that was at Closure North, um, which is in was it, well virtually is in Canada. Oh, of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> these days, yeah. Yes, that, yes. The, this is the new way we live is through screens. Yeah. But uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. we'll we'll link that in as well. Uh, that yeah. was a, that was a great talk, and and uh, you talk about similar things that we talked about here, but uh, probably more in depth on that talk. So that was really really a cool cool presentation. Thanks. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. I mean, it's fun to to be like, uh, I imagine like the people back at Xerox Park who could do mess around mm. with software and hardware. And I'm yeah. like, oh man, this is so cool. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. awesome to be able to just like, I guess it's the world we live in now today where you can just send off for PCBs and they come back a week later. Maybe yeah. maybe our kids will just print them off and they'll be, you know, yeah, you know another generation of Toby's even more yeah. direct. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully there's still a lot of interest in it. I think the, the dropping cost of electronics definitely makes you know, the interest level goes up and, uh, and that has been great for, you know, getting to meet new people like yourself. And, uh, and, and really personally, I love when software people come into the electronic space because you mm -hmm. often bring tool sets and mindsets that are like so different from kind of how I started in the hardware world Okay, yeah, that, yeah. uh, I feel like that's just a, um, you know, so like 
I do revision control now. Like, oh, yes, yeah. I, I should yeah, have known about that sooner, but like, yeah. but like doing that in the hardware world is, you know, kind of, a. I, I no longer get the, I, I, I sp very specifically remember getting yeah. the, uh, yeah. uh, the, you know, rev 48 part two dash use this one dot zip from a, a former coworker. Yeah. That's crazy. And I never, How did you I never that? get that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> that, I was, yeah. Like you're going to revise your schematic without checking it in. I'm like, how do, yeah. how do you, yeah. like, yeah. of course, yeah, it's, it's two, it's the mixture of two worlds, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. All right, great. Well, people should definitely check out Mike's uh, video and we'll link all that stuff in here. And uh, thanks again, Mike, thanks, for, Chris, uh, yeah. for, for being part of us here and uh, looking forward to talking to you again soon. All right, thank you. So that was our interview with Mike Fikes talking about ClojureScript and building custom hardware that can work with it in the real world. I think it's really great to pair up software and hardware like that. And, and I think that a lot of people that are either watching these, watching or listening to this podcast and or interested in the Contextual Electronics course, which is another part of Contextual Electronics, where there's a course where we teach you how to build hardware. A lot of people are coming in from the software world. So if you are a software person and you're interested in building hardware and you need a little help, the Contextual Electronics course will help try and guide you through and start to build your own hardware. You can also take the path like Mike has done. You know, he's built stuff on breadboards. He's kind of worked his way up to building, uh, to building his own custom hardware and he's found mentors. All of those steps are also really great for building, uh, you know, to, to get into building your own custom hardware. At the end of the day, you want to build something that you can d develop and design and put out into the world and hopefully change your environment. That's what we're really trying to do here. And I love that Mike was doing that specifically for Clojure Script, which is a, you know, something that's not normally associated with changing real world variables, but he is making that change because it's something he wants to be able to do. So again, if you're interested in doing this, you can always sign up for contextualelectronics.com. We have basically monthly memberships and that's something where you can, there's a bunch of different courses there and you can follow along. It's kind of like an apprenticeship style and that's something that we offer as part of uh, the Contextual Electronics experience. We'll have more podcasts here. If you're interested, please go and check out uh, the YouTube channel. That's where you can watch all of these videos. Uh, you can always subscribe in a podcast listener like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, any of those, uh, Google Podcasts. Uh, and of course, if you share it with your friends, we would love to you know, have more people learn about this course and also see more guests that we have who are working on electronics in various ways like Mike did. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.